There are two main elements to this film. A session with a client called Kate, who presents with a number of losses, including bereavement. And secondly, a review with her almost two years later. I think I coped with my mother initially fine because she was 88. She wanted to, she wanted to go. And I was kind of happy for her that she went as easily as she did. So it almost didn't seem like there was any reason to mourn. Um, it seems to have got harder than easier the more the time's gone by. So at first it seemed okay and that she was 88 and she was ready to go. But now as you're talking, you're clearly very upset. Yes. Um, I would say I wasn't close to my mum. But um, she was my mum. So whatever life was like when she, she and I were together, I miss her. I really miss her now. Loss is really at the heart of our lives. Whether we like it or not, we all experience a range of losses throughout our lives. The most obvious of these are the losses of close relationships. Our parents, perhaps a partner in a breakup or divorce, friends, other family members, even colleagues at work. Some of them die, all of them die at some point. Some of them just move on. Some of them break up in a lot of pain. So loss is really part of life. It's an important part of life, something that's inescapable. It's it's an, it's an essential part of being a human being. And the way in which we react and respond to the losses in our lives is really very important. When those losses are huge, when there are, for example, a bereavement or a divorce or breakup with someone that one felt very close with and loved, those types of enormous losses can be very painful. And staying with those feelings can be very, very difficult. So often it's easier, or so it feels, to put them aside in some way. If you like to put them into a kind of inner refrigerator or a deep freezer sometimes. Um, and that way we can kind of get on with our lives that, that particular time in our lives. We can put them in the freezer, but at some point they may defrost. At some point later in life, perhaps triggered by another experience of loss, earlier feelings can be defrosted and sweep out and over us. There's another way in which avoiding our feelings, putting them into the deep freezer, can hurt us and hurt our lives. And that's simply that when we put the feelings into the deep freezer, we also put part of ourselves in there. And that part is really an aspect of our heart. So in other words, it's a bit like taking part of our heart and putting it into a deep freezer. And we need our heart, we need our feelings with us every day. We need to be able to listen to our feelings, to our heart. 
And while we have a part of ourselves, an important part of ourselves, frozen in the freezer, we can never really feel at home in ourselves. Yes, the woman friend asked me, well, if we, before, if you were feeling like this, what would you normally do? And I guess, despite my distance from my parents, what I would have done in the past was to go home. And, but there isn't a home to go to now. So I, I've been feeling homeless at a kind of irrational level, but emotionally feeling hopeless. Right. That feels very important. Really. Um, I'm kind of also seeing you at 18, being homeless too. Having this, having to go and get another home. Mm-hmm but not really, not have, had a, not have had that kind of sense of a good home that you're leaving and can come back to. In the traditional medical model, which is also applied to mental health, there is a doctor and a patient and a treatment. And within that model, the only real active ingredient is the treatment. According to recent research on counselling and psychotherapy, together with the treatment, there are three other categories of factors that contribute to therapeutic change. The most important of them is actually the client or the patient. The research suggests that there are a number of client factors that contribute to therapeutic change, and two of the most important of them are hope and distress tolerance, or staying with pain. For a client to be able to work on their issues, to work on their therapeutic change, they need hope. Without hope, very little is going to happen. So recently, particularly, there has been a big focus on hope and how that can be facilitated by the counsellor or the psychotherapist in the therapeutic session. For a long time, the researchers have acknowledged the importance of the therapeutic relationship, but recently they've begun to look more closely. And Charles Gelso, for example, has identified three distinct but connected elements. The first of these is the working alliance, the second the transference countertransference relationship, and the third what he calls the real relationship. And this has had a number of other terms and certainly Rogers talks about it in terms of the, um, the, the, the counsellor being genuine, being present, and there being a, a real connection or person-to-person -person experience between client and counsellor. In this session and the subsequent review, you'll see both the connection, the person-to-person -person connection that we, the deep and profound person-to-person -person connection that we, that I and Kate make in that session. Then in the review, her referencing that as really very, very important. So that was a gift for me. So I felt seen by you. I felt utterly seen and utterly heard by you. And that was, you'll never quite know what a gift that was. So although I've just seen it again in the DVD, um, I didn't actually need reminding of that. And I'd, I'd almost forgotten that part of the grief was the loss of my home, the physical home that had been my parents' home. Um, and I think partly because I've subsequently moved house and 
for me what that has represented is that I have come home. So Which what, is one of the things we were looking at, wasn't that's it? That's right, mm. it was. It's one of the things that you mentioned. And as I was looking at the DVD, I thought, gosh, I'm not sure how much work I've done on that. And yet, actually, I've physically moved to a place that is truly home for me. Mm. That sounds really, really important, actually. It is, it is. So there's a sense in which I've finally grown up. <laughs> it's a, a, in the... You know, that I've taken responsibility for not having some other place be home. Mm. But here I am. The practitioner is also important, the particular practitioner. The particular self-awareness and self-development that a practitioner, for example, brings to the work. In this particular session, my own self-development, or the self-development that I had previously undertaken over a number of years, is very, very important. From my perspective, there is no way that I could sit there with Kate, listening to her so well, if I had not worked on my own experiences of loss and bereavement. Experiences that needed, I needed to have worked through so that they didn't overwhelm me in that session. If I'd still got them all frozen away, listening to Kate might well trigger the defrosting process, which would be really probably the worst possible outcome for the session. So by the time I came to this session with Kate, I had already worked a great deal on these losses and the subsequent implications of them. And I was able to sit there and be with Kate in the fullness of her grief, something that she found very valuable and which was, as I say, entirely dependent on the fact that I had worked on my own loss and bereavement. 